My guest here right now, as you see, is Michael Moore. And as planned, we also want to bring in a Yale historian, Tim Snyder, uh, who's an expert on authoritarianism, um, who joins Michael. And Tim, you uh, made some intellectual waves when you analyzed the January 6th insurrection problem uh, as an issue between gamers, uh, people who work within the technical rules to try to game the system, not unlike the gerrymandering in Michigan that Michael just mentioned, and then the breakers. Um, certainly, we have convicted seditionists now. Mr. Bannon is a convicted for defying the uh, Congress, and others are convicted for many things. Those are certainly uh, breakers, if not worse. I uh, wanted to get your views on anything you see in this dysfunction on the House floor, as well as the overlap between the number of people who are doing this thing, uh, who also supported or minimized uh, punishment for the January 6th uh, crime against the United States. Your thoughts on all of that, sir? Yeah, so, so number one, I think it's it's very important when people separate winning elections from being in the House of Representatives. So if you if you are a big liar, if you're somebody who says that Trump won the election, then what you're saying is that none of us is really here because of elections. You know, we're here for some reason, but we're not really here for, for, for because of elections. We've separated our legitimacy or our presence from actually winning elections, which means that we're not here for our constituents. You know, we're here for some ideological reason. We're here perhaps to to break up the government. That's that's number one. Number two, you know, you kindly mentioned the distinction between gamers and breakers. I mean, I think you're seeing that distinction work itself out, where there are people in the Republican Party who sincerely want the government to break. You just showed Steve Bannon. That's his whole philosophy. You know, the thing should just burn down and then we'll see what comes of it. This is what we're watching now. And I think the question is, following up a bit on what Mike said, the question is, where is the line in the Republican Party between the gamers and the breakers? And are there any gamers who actually care about the welfare of the United States? Because the distinction between a gamer and a breaker is a gamer is somebody who's just going to push voter suppression push gerrymandering and try to win. A breaker is somebody who wants to see it all burn. And, you know, the worst things that have happened in political history have been when those two groups end up being together. And so when I, when I watch this, I ask myself, are there actually, how many gamers are there out there who see something besides the game, who see the welfare of the U.S., who care about their constituents? For me, that's the question. Yeah, so you're speaking to something that's very important, significant, potentially very dangerous. Uh, I want you to respond, and then, Michael, after you. When you say you see this link, there are many people who are following this. We've seen people saying, oh, it's, it's chaos or the political intrigue or we mentioned House of Cards or Veep earlier. But those are all, I would call those all uh, conventional lenses, viewing this as a political brawl that will sooner or later be resolved. It seems that we're hearing from you, and I mentioned to viewers uh, for the, who don't remember, we have uh, the professor on here as an expert on authoritarianism. Uh, he's not here like some guests who root for one party or, or, or with that level of uh, vantage point. But as an ex expert on those issues, professor, um, do you, it sounds like you think this is something very different than that. While it has some of those ingredients, right? You count to a certain number, you make deals. This also is, in your view, directly linked to the uh, part of the Republican Party that are breakers and or supporting uh, the criminal end of democracy in the U.S. Yeah, well, we, we, I mean, as you sort of suggested earlier, we have an attempt to bring democracy in the United States to a criminal end not very long ago. And we have now a very large number of people in Congress who endorse that in one way or another. It's hard to expect that those are going to be people who take the Constitution seriously or who take unwritten or written rules very seriously. As a historian, one of the things I would point out is that parliaments, like our Congress, are really important. Um, very often when an authoritarian comes to power, one of the steps along the way is that the parliament stops taking itself seriously or people stop taking it seriously. And that that branch, the legislative branch, falls out of the picture, leaving the executive to pick up the pieces at some later point. That was a scenario in Germany in the 30s, by the way. So it's pretty important for a parliament to work and for people to take it seriously. And if you've got the power to make the parliament look ridiculous, you also have the power to, to make government seem like it ought to be trans transformed in a way where there should be a strong hand. And that's not going to happen tomorrow, but that's the, that is a drift of the way that things can go. Michael. Uh, first of all, it's uh, the more time you can give Timothy Snyder uh, on this uh, network, uh, the better, because uh, we are grateful uh, to him, to his book on tyranny that uh, he put out a few years ago. 
that sort of laid the, the framework for what we're all going through right now. Um, I think that, uh, that, and I hope, as I said before, that this is not going to, this isn't going to end tonight or tomorrow whether they leave town. So they won't be back till Monday. This, the, this will uh, continue. Um, people are worried, well, how's, how, Ameri how are we going to function as a country? We're fine. Everybody is already stocked up through COVID uh, in their cupboard, extra pop tarts and different things that, you know, to, we're not going to, no one's going to die. Um, but this is, it's so important that, um, that this is happening. And, um, and I think that, well, Julie Louis Dreyfus, who was on Seinfeld for many years, and then Veep, which uh, you just mentioned, last night on Twitter announced that unless the Emmy this year, if it is not handed to the Republicans in the United States Congress, uh, she is going to resign from the TV Academy. And I thought this is the kind of this is the kind of thing that we need right now to really put this in context. We don't have enough satire in this country because satire is such a great way to express uh, one's political uh, opinions. Uh, and the and the greater sense of this country right now of how we want to move on. The Trump era is over. He's over. He won't go away. That's OK. He, he, he we we're we're kind like that. He gets to stay in the country for now. But 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 the the the, the work that's going to be done. And let me just say, I hate I, I am not Sybil the soothsayer from the movie network. I hate coming on here. And you've asked me before to make predictions, but I kind of want to make one right now. Okay. And that is this. That is this. I believe that we will not have to wait till 2024 for the Democrats to regain control hmm. of the United States House of Representatives. There are just, as I said before, just a few votes need to flip uh, or become independent and caucus with the Democrats. That's going to happen. But also, it, the average number of con members of Congress that are elected every two years, between 10 and 20 of them never make it to the end of the two-year term. That 16 didn't make it in the last, between 2020 and 2022. So, and, and for a number of reasons, they pass away, they are indicted, uh, there's a scandal and they have to leave. Uh, they want another job. Uh, they're not making enough money doing this one. Whatever it is, there were 16 that didn't right. last to 2022. And I certainly believe, do you think that, that there won't be four or five that don't make it well, that speaks, uh, to the end of this? And that speaks to the math. I mean, P Professor Snyder, before you joined us at the top of the show, we talked about the larger factors because uh, I think a, a tendency in human life, certainly in the media, is to over-personalize things. So people say, oh, look at how disorganized McCarthy is compared to Boehner, who, whatever you think of him, you know, he, he got through it. Well, uh, Boehner had a much, much larger margin. And if there were five votes hanging for Boehner, he, he would not have become speaker. We went through that tonight before you joined us. And so uh, to Michael's point, um, buckle up. This is what five-vote margin looks like in this Republican Party with these kind of individuals, some of whom, as I mentioned, may not even really personally self-identify as members of that party. This, you know, We have this two-party system, but they may be something else. Then you go to the danger. I feel like it's interesting hearing from both of you because Michael is finding his notes of optimism, which isn't even really what you're known for, Michael. <laughs> but, uh, but the professor is, is reminding us what we should be warning uh, people about in the long term as a as a risk of, to use your word, Professor, drift. Doesn't mean it's definitely going to happen or soon. Uh, and so I did want to read one point uh, from your piece here. As, as we look at the 11th vote, I should mention uh, Congressman Good got up, nominated Kenny Hearn. There was the Trump nomination, which was more symbolic, uh, and the McCarthy nomination, obviously, in the 11th vote, without a lot of signs that McCarthy is going to do anything different uh, than get defeated for an 11th time. But we'll count as we go. We have the numbers on the screen. Uh, with that process going, Professor, you wrote, that some in the Republican Party, as we were discussing, want to break it and have the power without democracy for a coup to work in 2024, the breakers will require, I think we can put this up on the screen, uh, an angry minority organized for nationwide violence, ready to add intimidation to an election. Um, does any of that get strengthened by what the defectors view what they view as a show of force and efficacy over three days and counting this week. 
I, I think there there is a danger of a, a, a House of Representatives that is run, as it were, by remote control, where a, a few of the more radical members have disproportionate power, and they are essentially doing what um, Mr. Trump wants them to do at a time when he's not president and at a time when he's you know going to be have going through various kinds of uh, legal adventures. I think there's a danger that the House of Representatives will not only not do anything for two years, but it will be seen as you know a kind of a kind of just a place where there's just a ruckus all of the time, and the people who are in the minority, you know, will naturally portray this as nothing is getting done because of all the other guys. But it's actually, it's actually the people in the minority who will hold the whole thing hostage. And again, to, to repeat the worry, it's when the House of Representatives, when the Parliament can't do anything. And when you know the the executive, the president has to govern over it, that you get into a situation where people can get very anxious and and very upset. So I do worry that some of the people who are doing this, that it's not just chaos, it's not just like math. You know that this is that they have a long game, that they've been thinking about how this is going to play out over two years, and they're thinking about what's you know what this is going to look like in eighteen months when whoever their candidate is is coming up to run for president. So I think I think we ought to, I mean, we ought to give people credit for, even if we don't like them, give them credit for intelligence and think, you know, how are they gaming this out over the next 18 months? What are they trying to achieve now that's going to be relevant 18 months from now? I think that's really important. That's why we wanted to hear from you. And it goes a little bit different, deeper or around a corner than some of the iterative coverage, which is also important because everyone's trying to keep track of what's going on. So it's a really important ingredient. 